Hey, Life Church, thanks for joining us online. I just want to welcome you, whether you've been watching with us, whether you kind of come in person sometimes, or whether you're new to us online, I just want, I just want to welcome you this morning. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, I want to let you know of a few things. We do and are continuing our food drive, so if you have canned goods or non-perishables, uh, we do partner both with Valley View Food Bank, but we also open our doors. There's people that come in on a weekly basis into our building as well in need of food. And so if you have food, feel free to drop it off. And if you or you know somebody who needs food, you can come during our services here Sunday mornings at 9 till about noon or on Tuesdays from about 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock. We're here as well if there's need or you know someone who has need. Also want to let you know last week we started our Bible study in Galatians. It was great. We're going to continue that on. Uh, so tonight at 6.45 we will continue our study on Galatians. Masks are optional if you come, so just know masks are optional. You can choose to wear one or not. Also today at 12.45 after our second service, our 11 o'clock service in person here. If you wanna come, we're having what's called Welcome to Life, where you can come, you can meet, I'll be there, Pastor Derek will be there. You can hear a little bit more about Life Church, why we exist, what we feel we're called to, and you can come and bring questions as well. And lastly, we want to say thank you to all who have come in person and chosen to serve our kids' ministry. We have been able to move from one service Sunday mornings to offer kids for both services. Thank you so much. But as we continue on, the reality is, is if we want to sustain, we're going to need more people. Uh, and if they sense or if you sense the calling to serve in our kids ministry to kind of help bring teaching or even people to help be present with kids and serve them in ministry on Sunday mornings for either service, nine o'clock's mask required, 11 o'clock's mask optional for either service. Would you email the email address that's right down on the screen below here? Email that and say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in serving kids on Sunday mornings if that is something you feel called to do and are interested in doing. We'd love to have you. Hey, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Wherever you are, we're going to sing together. We're going to worship together as we lift up our hearts through song. So would you join us?
Well, good morning, Life Church. It's great to see you all this morning, and it's great to be with you. I hope you're having a great day, and uh, I'm looking forward to this time. Um, I want to begin the message in this way. Webster defines a portrait, a portrait, as a pictorial representation of a person or a graphic portrayal of a person in words. And human, as human beings, we love portraits, don't we? We do. We, we love them. We take them all the time of our family. We collect them of our friends. We put them on our walls. We even, some of us, have multiple portraits of the same person on the same wall, right? <laughs> Why? Why do we do that? Because a portrait captures something special, something unique about that person. It captures it. Well, today we're beginning a new sermon series entitled Portraits of Jesus. And that means that through this series, I want to go into Scripture, and I want to allow Scripture, hear this, I want to allow Scripture to paint for us a picture of Jesus that will capture for us something special and something unique about him. And the portrait of Jesus that I want us to look at today to start off with is the portrait of Jesus as the teacher, the teacher. But before we go there, Let's go to him in prayer. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time together with you. And Lord, with those that are watching with us or maybe just right now, just with you. God, thank you that we get to come before you. Thank you that we get to come before you, not because we made the decision, but you invited us. You invited us to come And in your invitation, God, we now want to sit at your feet. We want to hear your voice. And so speak to us. Give us ears to hear and minds to conceive and hearts to receive the particular message that you have for each and every one of us. And we pray this in your great and mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. Matthew 13, 54 says, when he finished teaching in the synagogue, they were amazed and they cried out, where did this man get this wisdom? Luke 19, 40, 48 says, as he taught in the temple, the people hung on his every word. John 7, 46 says, the temple guards reported to the Pharisees that no one has ever spoken the way this man does. No one. 
Friends and foes, believers and atheists alike, they all agree on at least one aspect of Jesus's life. He was the master teacher, a master teacher. Many proclaim that he was the greatest teacher that's ever lived. And he was such a great teacher that during his public ministry, four to 5,000 men, and then along with that, women and children on top of that. So it may have been 15 to 25, 30, who knows how many thousand, followed him wherever he went, into the desert, into the countryside, onto the mountains, along the seashores. They followed him. They followed him wherever they had to go just to get another crumb off of his teaching table. Friends, what was it about Jesus' messages, his sermons, his teachings? What was it that was so magnetic, that was so powerful, that people would go anywhere, literally anywhere, just to hear another message? What was it? Well, this morning... I want to begin by listing some of the reasons for the effectiveness of Jesus' teaching ministry. And the first reason is this. Jesus taught with authority. He taught with authority. Matthew 7, 28 and 29, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, says this. The crowds were amazed. Amazed because he taught as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Friends, when Jesus spoke... He spoke with authority. He didn't have to quote the experts like the scribes and the Pharisees did. He didn't have to say, thus saith the Lord, like the prophets of old did. Now, friends, when Jesus spoke, he spoke with an intrinsic power, an intrinsic authority that was all his own. He'd say things like, you've heard it said from your teachers, from your fathers, and from your father's fathers, you've heard it said. But then without batting an eye, he'd say, but I say to you, But I say to you, in other words, everything you've learned up to this point, you can just put all that on a shelf because I'm going to speak. I say to you, friends, that's authority. And at other times, he say things like, verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say unto you, which means this is the last word on the subject. You can throw everything else away, all the other possibilities, because this is it. Friends, when Jesus spoke, when he preached, when he taught, People couldn't leave without feeling like they had just heard a direct word from none other than God himself, which is, in fact, exactly what happened. Friends, when Jesus spoke, those people literally heard a direct word from God himself. And of course, that's the key to Jesus's authority. He was God in the flesh. And hear this, as God in the flesh, that means that when he spoke, he spoke the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In other words, when Jesus spoke, only truth proceeded from his mouth. And when that truth proceeded from his mouth, it came out with a kind of authority that only God possesses. And so when Jesus spoke with that kind of authority, people were amazed, absolutely amazed. The second reason for Jesus' effectiveness as a teacher is that he taught graphically. He spoke graphically. Friends, hear this. Jesus always spoke the truth, but he never spoke the truth using these colorless edicts or bland proclamations. I mean, he never said things like, the following will be the authoritative list of 245 timeless truths in order of their importance. No, Jesus didn't talk like that. He didn't communicate like that. Why? Because friends, he was our designer. Think about it. He's our creator. He knows. He knows us as his creator. And he knows, he knows that we think more in pictures than we do in sentences. We do. And so when he wanted to communicate to us, his people, his creation, he often painted pictures for people, word pictures. Let me remind you of one of those pictures. One day, Jesus said to those that had gathered around him, I want you to think of the biggest land animal in this entire country. What is it? The biggest land animal in all of Israel. What is it? It's a camel, right? Right? Now, picture that camel in your mind. You got it? Got the camel? Now, I want you to picture this little teeny tiny needle. And more precisely, I actually want you to picture the little tiny hole that's in the top of that little tiny needle, and that hole is called an eye. Can you picture that eye? 
Now, do you have the picture of the great big camel and the picture of that little teeny tiny eye of the needle fixed in your mind? Got it? Good. Now, I want you to walk that camel through the eye of that needle. (laughs) You can't do it, right? You can't do it. It's not humanly possible for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle. But friends, hear this. As soon as those people got a picture, that picture fixed in their minds, you know what Jesus did? He dropped a bomb on them. Dropped the bomb. He said, the odds of a rich man getting into heaven are about the same as the odds of a camel being able to go through the eye of a needle. Now, what was Jesus saying here? He was saying, look, look, there's something you need to understand about rich men. There's something you need to, rich men often have the tendency to see themselves as self-efficient, sufficient and self-made and and self-reliant. And because of that, They tend to be arrogant, right? They tend to be puffed up to the point where they actually refuse to humble themselves even before God. And so he says, if a rich man is gonna make it into heaven, if he's gonna make it into heaven, it's not because he's wealthy and it's not because of any of the efforts that he has. No, if a rich man is actually gonna make it into heaven, it's because something supernatural has taken place. Just like, friends, something supernatural has to take place to get that camel through the eye of a needle. It needs to be supernatural, right? The only way it can happen, just like that, something supernatural has to take place for a rich man to get into heaven. Friends, when Jesus painted that picture, everybody there, everybody there, from the rich to the poor, they got that picture. They got it. Because Jesus painted it vividly. He was a master teacher. On other occasions... He started many of his teachings by saying things like, think of a log in your eye. Or think about losing a coin or a sheep or a son. Or or think about a seed being sown into a field. Or think about how salt adds flavor to your food. Or think about how a light shines. or, Or think about finding a treasure or finding a pearl of great price. Friends, when Jesus taught, he painted graphic pictures. But he also taught through stories. Stories, illustrations that were contemporary to his culture. Of course, that would mean, if in his culture, that he would need to talk about wine presses and noblemen and servants and vineyards, the kind of things that actually confuse many of us in all our culture. Why? Because they're not contemporary to our culture, but they were to his. They were to his. Now, most of you know from hearing me week after week, that I try to use contemporary illustrations, contemporary stories that for you and me fit because they relate to us in our culture, in our day, and so it's easy to relate to them. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. In fact, to help you kind of grasp the point that I'm getting at here, I wanna modernize a couple of his parables. And the first parable I wanna modernize is the parable of the Good Samaritan. If Jesus were telling that parable today in our culture, Right here in Phoenix, I think he'd tell it something like this. Late one night, there was a man driving through the inner city of Phoenix, and his car broke down. And you can guess what happened to him, right? He gets mugged, he gets beaten, he gets knifed, and he's left for dead. Well, a little later that night, the bishop of Phoenix comes in in his motorcade. He's in the back seat of his limo. He's reading some very important papers, very important papers. And while he's reading those papers, his driver makes mention that it looks like there might be somebody that's hurt and laying alongside of the road. And of course, the bishop is genuinely concerned. And so he looks out the window and he offers up a little prayer. But then he turns back to his driver and he says, keep moving, don't stop. We're already late for our meeting. And besides, I'm sure somebody else is gonna come along. Well, sure enough, a little bit later, somebody else does come along. It's a pastor of a little church, start church in Northwest Uh, Phoenix, Peoria, to be exact. And he's on his way with his wife to uh, go to a home of a friend. And as he's driving along, he sees this man who's hurt and he's laying on the side of the road. But since it's late and since his wife is with him, even there's plenty of room in the car for this guy to be put in, he doesn't want to jeopardize the safety of his wife. And so instead of pulling over, he steps on the gas pedal and takes off, all the while hoping that somebody else will come along. And sure enough, somebody else does. Only this time, the driver isn't some Catholic priest and it's not some Protestant clergyman. No, this time the the driver is dog-tired 
a longing for bed landscaper who has just finished working a 16 hour day. But when this landscaper sees what he thinks is a man who's lying on the side of the road, he stops and he picks this guy up. In spite of the blood, he puts this guy in his car and he drives him to the nearest emergency room. When he gets there, he gently carries him in and he gives the emissions people his credit card number. And he says, whatever it takes. This guy didn't have insurance. Give him whatever it takes. I'll take care of it. With that, I think Jesus would have looked at all of us and asked the question, who was neighborly to that man? Who was neighborly? The bishop, the pastor, or the landscaper? Who was it? The landscaper, right? Then I can just hear Jesus say, you got it. You got it. Now go and do likewise. Be like the landscaper. Or how about the parable of the prodigal son? How would Jesus have told that one if he lived here today in our, in our culture? Well, there was a man in Peoria who had two sons. And just before it was time for his youngest son to go off to college, that youngest son went to his dad and said, hey, dad, you know, I've been doing some serious thinking, some really hard thinking. And you know all that money you've been putting back for my education? Well, it seems to me that pouring all that money into some lousy degree is just an awful waste of your money. And so, dad, I got plans. I got big plans. And so I'd like to have my education money now. Because dad, four years from now, I don't want to be starting from scratch. I want to be out there rolling dice with the big boys. And his father listened to his son as he heard that. You know what he thought. He thought he's going to blow it. But he graciously gave it to his son anyway. Well, a few days later, this son booked a first class flight ticket to Las Vegas when he got there, he went rented out a penthouse suite. He threw parties and he played the tables and he employed women for professional purposes. And then he lived in the fast lane, the fast lane. But of course, not for long because friends, money in the fast lane never lasts very long. And so before he knows it, he is completely broke, completely broke in a city that is far away from home. And so this young man from Peoria begins cleaning toilets in the downtown bus station for minimum wage. Unfortunately, he has to wait two weeks to get his first paycheck, right? And so during that time, he sleeps on the street and he eats whatever he can find. As a matter of fact, late one night, his hunger becomes so great that as he's finishing one of the stalls in the bathroom, he sees a couple of rats in the corner and they're fighting over a half-eaten bologna sandwich. And he is so hungry, he actually joins them in that fight. The next morning when he wakes up in his alleyway that he's been sleeping in, he finally comes to his senses and he realizes to himself saying, hey, my dad's stock boys live better than this. I'm sleeping in an alley. I'm fighting rats for food. I'm going home. And I'm going to say, Dad, I was wrong. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And so I'm not asking you to take me back. I just want a job. I just want some food. And I just want a roof over my head. With that mindset, that young man from Peoria hitchhikes all the way back to the intersection of Bell and the 101, where he gets out and he starts walking towards his house. And the closer he gets, of course, the more he begins to worry about what his dad is going to think and do. As he turns the corner onto his street, there's his dad. Literally, his dad is standing at the end of the driveway waiting for him. And when his dad sees him, he takes off. He takes off in an all-out sprint, and when he reaches his boy, he throws his arms around him, and he gives him a great big hug and a great big kiss. And the son, 
who is so filled with shame, he doesn't really know what to say or do, says, Dad, I am so sorry. I blew it. I was wrong. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But hear this, overjoyed, overjoyed, his dad can't hear him. He can't hear him. He says, son, I love you. I've been waiting for you. I bought you a whole closet worth of clothes. I got my credit cards right now just sitting on the dresser in your room. And you got five pair of Nikes in the closet right now, brand new. And I've made standing reservations at your favorite restaurant. The day you left, I put that in. And so call your friends because we're going to have a party to end all parties. And then I can just see Jesus turning to the crowds and saying, that's how my father receives repentant, wayward sons and daughters. That's how. And then I can think I could see him turning to each one of us and looking us straight in the eye and saying, come, please come back home to your father's house. He's waiting for you. He loves you with an extravagant and unconditional love. You won't believe the welcome he wants to give you. You won't believe the love he wants to pour upon you. Please come to your senses and come home. Friends, what a story, right? What a teacher. He taught with authority. He taught with authority. He always gave the last word on issues. He said, this is it, plain and simple. He taught graphically so that people could understand what he was saying. He taught with contemporary stories so people could relate to what he was saying. And finally, he taught practically. Practically, because he expected, hear this, he expected people to implement what he was saying. He spoke practically. Friends, there were no philosophical quagmires with Jesus. No lofty, high, unattainable ideals. No, without apology, Jesus laid it out for people plain and simple. Why? Because he expected people to do it. He expected people to implement his words. And so he'd say things like, wayward sons and daughters, come home. Come home and receive the forgiveness from your father. He's been waiting to give you. Come home. And he'd say, brothers and sisters who are warring with one another, don't go to church and play religious games. Don't put your sacrifice on the altar. Don't try to make things right with me until you've actually tried to make things right with your brother or your sister. Or he'd say other practical things like, stop. Stop. Stop your worrying about tomorrow. Worry's a waste of your time. Instead, trust in me. I hold the future. He'd say things like, stop stealing and start working honestly. Stop being so greedy and start giving graciously and generously to God and to others. Stop committing adultery and start being faithful to the spouse that God's given you. Feed the poor, clothe the naked, care for the afflicted. Show special concern for little children and seek first the kingdom of God. Friends, do you see what's happening here? Without apology, Jesus is laying it on the line. He's saying that these are some practical ways for men and women and children to think and to act so that their lives can be full, they can be rich, and they can be pleasing to God. These are some practical ways to live that kind of life. But he also brought practical understanding to life's greatest questions. He said, here's where you came from. You're created in the image of a personal God. Here's what sin does to you. It makes you a marred image of your creator. Here's what you need. You need a loving savior who's paid the price for you and your sins and who can cleanse you from them. Here's how you get to heaven. By believing in me, Jesus Christ, and by taking me as Savior and Lord. Here's how you go to hell. By rejecting me and by refusing to acknowledge me in my Lordship. Here's how you make your life count in the meantime. By seeking first my kingdom. Here's how you make yeah, here's how you act in the marketplace, he said. Here's how you build a church. Here's how you build a marriage. Here's how you build a family. Here's how you build a relationship. 
Friends, Jesus very practically answered life's greatest questions principle by principle by principle. He said, there's no mystery to these things. Even little children can understand them and apply them to their lives. That's why at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he didn't pull any punches when he gave his word of warning, when he said, if you've heard my teaching, let me say it again. If you've heard my teaching and you have no plans to act on them, no plans to implement them into your lives, then you're just as foolish as the man who built his house on a foundation of sand. Because when the rain comes and the winds blow and the waves beat, your house is gonna come tumbling down and it's all gonna fall apart. Friends, you and I have seen that, haven't we? We have seen that over and over again. We've seen it inside and we've seen it outside of the church. People refusing to listen to the practical truth of Jesus People refusing to build their lives on the solid rock of God's word. When the, and when the storms of life come, and they do come, when they come, those lives are beaten into ruins. Friends, if you and I want to avoid that tragedy, if we want a life that won't be swept away by the storms of life, then the only way to do that is to implement it's to actively live out Jesus' teachings. It's that plain, and to be honest, and it's that simple. Now I want you to think about something. Ready? Think about this. What would you give? How far would you go? What would you be willing to do to actually sit at Jesus' feet and hear a practical, authoritative, graphic sermon that you could relate to and that would directly speak to your life today? How far would you go? What would you give? What would you be willing to do to get a direct word from Jesus? Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, Derek, that's kind of a moot issue, isn't it? I mean, I, why would I waste my time you know, asking hypothetical questions since Jesus' teaching ministry has long since ceased? Friends, if that's what you're thinking... Be careful, be very careful because Romans 8, 9 tells us very clearly that if you're a believer, if you're a Christ follower, then Christ's spirit called the Holy Spirit, Christ's spirit dwells in you. You wanna know one of the primary roles of the spirit is to teach us. One of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit is to teach you and me to follow him. Friends, because of this, Jesus' teaching ministry, hear this, Jesus' teaching ministry through his spirit still goes on today. Yes, bodily. Jesus left this world at his ascension, right? That's when he left this world. But through his spirit, he abides in each and every one of us as his followers. And one of the primary roles of Christ's spirit is to teach us. And so how does he do that? How does Jesus Christ teach us through his spirit today? Well, quickly, quickly, there are at least three ways that he does it. First, Christ, excuse me, Christ's spirit teaches us through his word. He teaches us through the reading and meditating on his word. Now, here's the thing. I know even as I say that some of you guys and gals are shutting me down right now, Right? Your minds are turning off. You're drifting to some other place in time because you have heard this broken record before, right? Well, friends, here's the truth. You're gonna hear it again and again. As long as you keep coming to this church, as long as I'm preaching here, you're gonna keep hearing it. Why? Because I know enough of you. Hear this. I know enough of you. I have fellowshiped enough with many of you. I have counseled with enough of you. And I have seen the pain and the heartbreak in enough of you to know that deep down inside, all of us, all of us need a word from God. We need a word of God, from God. Some of us need a word of comfort. Some of us need a word of encouragement. Some of us need a word of peace. Some of us need a word of approval. Some of us need a word of forgiveness. Some of us need a word of love. Some of us need a word of assurance. Some of us need a word of correction. Friends, here's the truth. I don't know what you need, but the truth is we all need a word from God, don't we? And the primary way that God has chosen to communicate to us his word is through his scriptures. 
And friends, the truth is this. Far too few of us, please hear this, far too few of us read and meditate on the scriptures enough to truly receive the word that God wants to give us. That's the truth. And friends, I gotta tell you, it is a horrible, terrible thing to stand back and to watch people as they wander and they search and they hurt and they yearn for the word from God and knowing all the while that that word that they're so desperately searching for is as close as the dusty old Bible on their bookshelf that they refuse to open up. Friends, if you ever intend to hear a word from God in a practical, useful way, in a way that can heal your heart, in a way that can renew your mind, in a way that can transform your life, then you have to make a priority out of reading your Bible. And when you do, when you start reading your Bible, if you wanna hear a word from God, don't read it for the mileage. Don't say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make myself read four chapters today. No, friends, if you truly wanna hear from God, don't read the Bible for the mileage. Read the Bible for the message, for the message. And so literally take 10, 15 minutes. It may take five, it may take two, it may take one. But as you go into it, say to God, God, I wanna hear from you today. Give me a challenge. Give me a direction. I want to hear from you today. I want something in your word to come alive to me today. Speak to me through your word. And I'm telling you, at some point as you read, he's going to do that. He's going to give you a word that you need to hear. Friends, the primary means by which Christ's spirit speaks to us today, teaches us today, is through his book, his word, his Bible. But he also uses other believers. You see, as our teacher, Christ's spirit, think about it, as our teacher, Christ's spirit has a goal for each and every one of our lives, right? He does. And his goal is to conform us to the image of Christ. That's his goal. And he'll use whatever channel he deems best to accomplish that for you and me. For example, one time in the Old Testament, he actually spoke through a donkey, a jackass to a person, didn't he? God did that. And friends, hear this. If God can use a jackass, God can use me and you too, right? Yeah, Amen. Now, remember when David, King David, committed adultery with Bathsheba? Remember that? When he did that, he knew he was wrong. He did. He knew he was wrong. He knew what the scriptures had to say, but he wasn't listening. He didn't want to hear the scriptures. Why? Because he wanted to keep on keeping on. And so you know what God did? God changed the channels on him. God changed the channels. He sent a person a person by the name of Nathan. And when Nathan came, you know what Nathan did? He shared with David God's word. And remember what happened? David heard God's word through nation, Nathan, and he repented. He turned from his way and he started going God's way. He repented. Now, friends, I don't know about you. I don't know how it is in your life. I don't, because God communicates differently with each and every one of us. But some of the most meaningful words in my life that have come of God that have come to me have come through other people. To be honest, those have often come in casual conversations with family or friends or with staff members or with committee members or my wife, or to be honest, this happened this past week over and over again with many of you. Just this past week, Christ has spoken to me over and over and over again through many of you. He's used you to minister to me and to comfort me and to embrace me and to love me. And I thank you, and I thank God for that. And friends, that's why Scripture repeatedly encourages us to develop deep and authentic relationships with one another. Because as you and I come together with other believers online or in person, God may very well choose that time to speak to us the very word, the very word that we need to hear. And so this week, make it a point to fellowship. Make it a point to come together online or in person and then be ready. Be ready because God may truly speak exactly what you and I need to hear through a friend, through a family member. Be ready. Now, there's one more way that Christ speaks to us. At times, Christ's spirit speaks to us directly. Directly. Not just through his word, and not just through other believers, but there are times that Christ's spirit will speak to us directly. Now, I know that sounds kind of mystical and, and magical, right? You know why it does? Because it is. 
It's incredible. But as incredible as it seems, Romans 8, 16 points this out, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit himself communicates directly with our spirits. Now, when I talk about that kind of communication, I like to call it an impression. And the reason I like to call it an impression is because it's a time where Christ's spirit comes and he impresses on our spirits thoughts or words that he wants us to have, leaving an impression on us. And so if you're a believer, this kind of communication, this kind of impression can actually take place anytime and anywhere. As a matter of fact, there have been many times where I'm walking down the street or I'm driving in a car or I'm on a hike someplace. And all of a sudden, I have this impression that God is saying something to me like, Derek, you're mine and I love you. You need to hear that right now. You're mine and I love you. Or Derek, what are you doing, boy? You're stepping back into sin again. And so I'm telling you directly right now, you need to confess it and move beyond it. Or Derek, I want you to stop everything you're doing right now. Drop to your knees and pray and pray hard because so-and-so needs it. Friends, there are times that God breaks in and he says, I have a word for you right now. And if your heart is open, if, if your heart is receptive, if you're sensitive to the things of God, then in that moment, God is going to impress on you a message, a message of his presence, a message of his approval, a message of his correction or, or his comfort. But he's going to impress upon you a word you need to hear. Friends, Jesus, the master teacher, hear this. He is still communicating even today to those who have ears to hear. And so let Christ's spirit teach you through his word. Read it, meditate on it. He will speak to you and he'll teach you through other believers. And so spend time with other believers regularly. And from time to time, he's gonna teach you by talking directly to you. Now hear this, he doesn't have to. He wants to. And he wants to because he loves you. Friends, remember this. When you hear God, if you don't obey, then you are just like that man who built his house on sand. And when the storms of life come, and they will come, your house will fall. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you wanna constantly communicate with us. And you do that through your word, you do it through other people, you do it through direct communication. God, thank you. And God, thank you that you took the time to teach. You actually walked in this world and you taught so we could learn what it means to walk in the fullness of life, so we could learn what it means to live in abundance of life, so we could learn what it means to live as you designed us to live. Thank you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we close, I wanna give us four different ways to respond again. But I'm gonna start a little differently than in the past. If you're ready to take a step of faith today, I wanna to share with you one more way that Jesus taught while he was here on this earth. There were times he taught without words. Without words. He taught without words when he turned water into wine. He taught without words on the Mount of Transfiguration. He taught without words in the triumphal entry and at his death and on the resurrection and at his ascension. He taught without words on many, many, many occasions. But the time I want us to focus on today is the time where he was driven out of the synagogue in Nazareth where he grew up. Jesus was just beginning his ministry. And so this was probably the first time and maybe the only time he actually ever talk, taught in his hometown of Nazareth. When he was done, 
Luke 4, 28 through 40 says this, when he's done teaching, it says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and they drove him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he turned and walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now I wanna ask you a question. If Jesus had the power to walk right through the midst of this crowd, which he obviously did, then why did he wait until they had driven him to the very edge of the cliff before he did it? Why did he wait? I've asked that question to scores of scholars, and I'm telling you, not one scholar has ever given me what I could consider a satisfactory answer. But some 25 years ago, I asked that question of a high school guys group. In that group, we had been talking about how Jesus often uses everything around him, the birds and the mustard seeds and the millstones, etc., to help people grasp the truth that he wants to communicate. And when I asked this question, why did Jesus wait until the crowd had driven him to the edge of the cliff before he turned and he walked through their midst? When I asked that question, there was one young man, he raised his hand and he said, well, Derek, maybe he wanted them to know they had a choice. They could continue walking in the direction they were going to the edge of the cliff and experience death. Or they could walk, they could turn with Jesus as he walked through their midst and have life. They could stay in the direction they're going and have death. Or they could turn and follow Jesus and walk to their life. If you're ready to take a step of faith right now, if you're ready to turn, and follow Jesus, and have life, then join me in this simple prayer right now. It's not the words, it's the attitude of the heart. God, I bring myself before you and I wanna be yours. Lord, I know there's all kinds of stuff that's piled up inside of me, so wash me clean. Wash me clean, forgive me. And then Lord, adopt me in your family. I wanna be one of your kids. I want you to raise me from this point on to go in your way, to walk in your way, to be filled with your life and love, to serve you and you alone. So on this day, I give myself to you, Lord. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you just took that step of faith, then I want to encourage you to tell somebody. Share it with somebody. One way you can do that is actually go on our website and share that with our prayer team. Which leads us to the second way that you and I can respond. And that's by receiving prayer for yourself or for others. And as I mentioned, we have a prayer wall on our website. Please go there. I, I'm telling you, every single day I receive prayer requests and that's the first thing I do when I receive those prayer requests from the prayer team. I'm a part of the chain of that. There's a whole bunch of people that are praying, but I'm a part of that chain. And when it comes in, I pray for those things. I know our team does. And where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is. So do that right now. Third, another way that you and I can respond to God, this God who loves us and who cares for us, is to get back to him, right? To get back to him with our time and our talents and our treasures. And there's two ways right now that you can give your treasures from home. One is to go on the website, you can give there. And the second one is to give by check and send it to the Life Church of the Northwest Valley, 8765 West Kelton Lane, building B3, Suite 140, Peoria, Peoria Arizona, 85382. It should all be below me right now. And then the fourth way for you and I to respond is to go. But as we go, it's to go to bless others to bless others. And that an acronym for, for us means this, B, begin with prayer. Begin with prayer for the people and the places where you live, work, study, and play. Right where you're at. You don't need to go somewhere else. Right where you're at. And then L, as you do that praying and you have opportunity to encounter those people, listen to them, L, listen to them. And as you listen to them, Look for opportunities to eat with them, go deeper with them, encourage them. And so as you encourage them, you eat with them, get to know them better. As you listen to them, as you pray for them, you're gonna have opportunities to serve them, the first S. And then the last S 
is you're going to have the opportunity as you serve them, as you get to know them better, as you listen to them, as you pray for them, you're going to have the opportunity at some point or another to share God's story and your story and share it. What a great story. What a life-changing story. Now as you go, I want to encourage you and encourage me to truly live like Jesus and love like Jesus and share his message everywhere we go because when you and I do that, it brings life to our friends, to our families, to our neighbors, and to our world. God bless you as you bless others.